My name is Lourdes Perechada, and uh, we are very happy today to have a new session of the Grappa Virtual Congress Highlights. Uh, on today's session, we're going to focus on the most uh, outstanding abstracts related to psoriatic disease from the latest uh, dermatology conference, EADV conference that happened in September in Amsterdam. And, and just to provide some background for those who are new to this uh, activity, the goal of this meeting is to have both dermatologists and rheumatologists uh, reviewing these uh, important abstracts that were presented at the, at the major conferences related to dermatology and rheumatology. So today we're going to be discussing the abstracts for EADV, uh, but we also have host sessions for uh, abstracts uh, after the AAD conference ACR on Euler. Um, the, the way we do this, we will have uh, three different uh, uh, young GRAPA members who have been supervised by three senior GRAPA members uh, on the preparation uh, of these abstracts. They will be presenting. We will have uh, 10 minutes for presentation and then around five minutes for discussion. And during that five minutes of discussion, we will be um, inviting you to provide questions through the chat or the Q&A box here in Zoom, so you can feel free to put your questions in. Um, so now I hand it over to Fabian, who's co-hosting this uh, with me, uh, to continue. Yes, thank you so much, Lourdes. Thanks for giving the uh, introduction to this uh, webinar today. And it's a real pleasure being here with you today to um, yeah, moderate and go through the agenda um, together with you, especially for me, it's a great uh, opportunity to see the highlights that were presented just recently at the EADV in Amsterdam, because I as I am a rheumatologist and I was not able to participate in person. So I'm really looking forward to hear from the brilliant uh, young Grappians about their selected highlights that were um, then prepared on the super, under the supervision by senior Grappa members. And I think without any further ado, we can almost start. There's only one thing, because we also have Chris Lindsay as the chair of the Grappa PRP seal on board today, and she will contribute with the PRP perspectives on the um, presented abstracts. And we are really happy to have you here, Chris. It's a pleasure to uh, share the stage with you again. And yeah, so I think we can start and, and we'll, we will start with the basic science highlight that are presented by Dimitri, Dimitri Luz from Brazil, and he was supervised by uh, Samuel Wang from uh, University of California. Um, Dimitri, the stage is yours, and without any further ado, we are looking forward to hear what you have um, yeah, collected as the highlights on basic science on psoriatic disease from EADV this year. Great, thank you. Thank you, Fabian, Lourdes, and everyone to have me here. Uh, it was actually a great pleasure of taking part of the EADV. And talking about basic science is always so uh, challenging because it's something that is like in the beginning of it and how, but my, my objective here was like trying to, to explain better how we can, what we can expect of it. So yeah, go ahead. Those are my conflicts and Dr. Wang's conflicts as well. Next. So the first one, we, and I got three abstracts, was it's not that basic science, but I thought it was like just awesome that we have an international Delphi consensus to define a clinically appropriate definition of disease modification for plaque psoriasis. And why I think that's so important. Uh, we know uh, now we have we're talking a lot about how the disease can be controlled, brought into remission, what is remission, what is uh, sustained response of medications, how did, how that can be like the disease modification. So I think it's like we don't have a appropriate definition of disease modification. And I think uh, this Delphi, it's, it's something that can help us. So their aim was to achieve consensus on the definition of disease modification, of course, and they had a search with terms as disease modification, disease progression, disease interception, treatment target, drug therapy, biomarker, and drug free remission. And next, please. So it was uh, 35 statements that they got. It was divided into six main topics. 
and then 35 statements that were voted. And to achieve a consensus, there will have to be a very high agreement, more than 90% of accordance. So they had um, they had tons of uh, dermatologists. It was actually 97 dermatologists from North America and Europe. And that's something that I would like to point out that we don't have the presence of other parts of the world in this consensus. So that can be something that is like, Maybe it's not the full understanding of the world on it, but it's the only consensus we have. So I think it's very interesting. And uh, most of the doctors were actually clinicians, not really, and some were clinicians and researchers, of course. So please, uh, next one. So the consensus, of course, that are, what is important is that the disease modification is a sustained improvement in the disease course of plaque psoriasis, resulting from a change in pathophysiology that minimizes the need for treatment. So that's disease modification. And now that we can hear about disease modification, we can think in this way. So I think that's something that is re very practical and pragmatic. So I liked it. Uh, next, please. The second uh, work that I would like to point out is this Sutrella Wads Worthensis as a hallmark of the gut microbiome in patients with severe psoriasis. It's also from, from people from Brazil and from Grappa. They had a aim to compare the intestinal microbiome of patients with severe plaque psoriasis with individuals without psoriasis and without a positive family history of psoriasis. And I... I think it was interesting, actually, because microbiome is always like uh, it's trendy and then it's not trendy and then people study it a lot. And then it was like a wave of not, not studying it that much. And then it's coming back again. So they had these stool samples of 30 pa patients with psoriasis and 30 patients without psoriasis, age and gender matched. And they had the sequencing of uh, RNA of these two samples. And next, please. So the results, basically they had the same uh, profile, epidemiology profile of like female uh, around like 48 years old with comorbidities about the same, about the same BMI. So pretty much the same profile of patients. Next, please. And then they analyzed it, uh, the whole uh, sequencing of RNA. And this, this Sutrella, this class of bacteria, Sutrella genus and Sutrella wadsworthensis were actually the species that were more, uh, there were more in higher quantity in patients with psoriasis in these two microbiome samples. So that can be like Sutrella is a bacteria that is very implicated with the role of IBD and it's, it's a bacteria that plays an important role in IgA degradation. So it can compromise intestinal epithelial integrity and that could be like opening more, uh, let's say this way, the intestines to absorb more toxins of bacteria and uh, trigger some immune responses in the body. Um, the Sotrella so is actually higher in the people with psoriasis and not uh, present in people without psoriasis. So the study basically concludes that there is a different compositions of the gut microbiome in patients with psoriasis and without psoriasis. And that's important, I think, uh, because we can always like, it, of course, it's something that is all, only from Brazil. So Brazilian patients, maybe it's not the same in other parts of the world. And they don't have, uh, they don't point out uh, the levels of PASI or like how severe the disease was when they collected it. But it's a data, it's something that is actually, that can lead us to the microbiome and maybe understanding better uh, the profile of microbiome in psoriasis. And the next, it will, it's the adponectin and risk of psoriasis. 
An observational and Mendelian randomization studies in up to nine nine hundred thousand individuals. Is a study from people from Denmark, and what they highlight is, of course, we know PSO is often associated with obesity, and they share some TH seventeen uh, driven profile and uh, some interleukins. So the key question was. Uh, is adiponectin related to psoriasis? So low levels of adiponectin can be the cause of psoriasis. And next, please. So just to make a highlight, uh, this is not from the work, but I thought it would be interesting to bring it up, bring it up here. And that's a slide from Dr. Samuel, is to show adiponectin as, as something that is, is actually in a, a substance secreted by the adipocyte and that can have a anti-inflammatory uh, an anti-inflammatory um, function so when you have adiponectin you have a, a lot of anti-inflammatory function on the body so it's kind of like down regulating the inflammation and whenever you have higher and higher adipocytes so obese patients they have bigger adipocytes, and that doesn't mean that they're going to secrete more adiponectin. It's actually the adipocyte, it gets like kind of like sick, so it doesn't produce as much as adiponectin as it should be. And maybe this uh, obesity could lead to a low, uh, low levels, sorry, a high levels of adiponectin, sorry guys, low levels of adiponectin, that is anti-inflammatory, so high levels of inflammation. That's what I'm trying to say. So inflammatory mediators linking psoriasis and obesity, so adiponectin as a low level of adiponectin could lead to psoriasis. And that's what we usually have in literature. And then next. So the method was actually to, to measure plasma adiponectin in PSO in patients of this uh, general population study of Copenhagen, they had one sample of Mendelian randomization analysis that was like around more than 100,000 patients. And then two sample Mendelian randomization an analysis also from all those other biobanks as well. Next. So what is Mendelian randomization? This again is not from... Uh, the article, but I thought it would be interesting for us to have an idea of what it is, and then Dr. Samuel can always explain it better again. But to be like very, very simple in the explanation, Mendelian randomization would be like a randomized clinical trial for people. Mendelian randomization is for genes. So you take a lot of genes, and then you kind of like random allocation of the alleles, and then we can actually compare like effect uh, alleles versus control uh, genes. So that's interesting to understand the profile of uh, this. And it's actually a very strong uh, methodology to prove causality of uh, a causality effect. So if you have uh, cause and consequence, this can be proved by Mendelian randomization. So the definition would be as instrumental variable analysis, and they use SNPs and everything. And as results of the study, they show that uh, the hazard ratio of psoriasis for adiponectin, it would be 0.67%. So whenever you have increase in plasma adiponectin, you have a low hazard ratio. So it would be like, the higher the adiponectin, the lower the risk of psoriasis. In other words, I would say like low levels of adiponectin can cause psoriasis. But then when you go through the Mendelian randomization, we see that it's actually, there is no hazard risk because it goes from less than one to more than one. So 0 0.77 to 2.32 and the same into simple Mendelian randomization. So next. So in actually in conclusion, what we can say is that low plasma adiponectin 
is not associated with uh with psoriasis. So what we want to say in this is like, of course, after the Mendelian randomization, there is no causality of low adiponectin levels triggering psoriasis or being like the onset of psoriasis. And that could be like something that we can say. Of course, we cannot conclude only out of this work, but it's like maybe obesity doesn't cause psoriasis. That's we can we can actually fear of it. And probably psoriasis can actually take to low levels of adponectin, and that can be a causality effect that is better explained with this article. So that's why we thought it was so interesting to bring it in here. Um, and next. So the implications would be like, and that's our conclusion of the conclusion is that low levels of adponectin is not likely to be causing PSO. And next. So that's a picture of Amsterdam, my context. Thank you so much for the attention. Yes, thank you so much, Dimitri, for the brilliant overview of the basic science highlights that were presented at EADV and also to you, Sam, for supervising Dimitri in the preparation. And now we invite you to the stage as well. And um, we kindly invite everyone in the audience to write your questions in the chat that you might have or your comments, because maybe you have a perspective on the things presented. And as said, we are really happy that we have you here in the call as well, Chris. So I think the first question we would like to give the stage to you as the patient. Um, so maybe you have any questions on the uh, topics presented. Um, not so much. I'm, I guess as a patient, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the whole association with obesity. So I think it's really interesting that this data showed um, in these data sets that it, it didn't, obesity didn't cause psoriasis, but there's still obviously been an association of, of obesity with psoriasis. So I wonder what would be the next question as a scientist, Dimitri, you would want to ask to understand that. Or, or Sam, maybe that's too challenging, but Sam. I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it, it, this is, that's a great question, and it's actually work that uh, we have done uh, in our laboratory uh, to some extent. And, and I, I think uh, Dimitri did a brilliant job. Uh, some of the, these concepts are very difficult, actually, and I, I, I think he learned a lot during uh, looking at some of the techniques that people use, particularly the Mendelian randomization, which is something that... that I don't do, I'm not a geneticist, but uh, they're doing this a very powerful technique to identify causality. Uh, so your question was about uh, obesity and psoriasis. Yes, there is a well-known co-association between the two, but um, the the epidemiology studies that we, we do, these observational studies that we do, they can't really answer causality. They can say, yes, something is associated with a condition, however, to, to answer this question of, of causality, you have to do it in, 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 in several ways in a hypothesis-driven manner. The, the simple problem, for many years, as uh, Dimitri's diagram showed, many people thought that obese, the reason obesity influenced psoriasis or increased psoriasis risk was through the adipocytes themselves participating in some, some manner. And, and cytokines like adiponectin were thought to play a, a possibly a, a very instrumental role in allowing uh, adipocytes to produce inflammatory cytokines and thus drive the psoriatic process. Okay. So one, in, in simply said, you could say that perhaps the, adip, the adipocytes, the fat cells themselves in obesity are different, and that's what's driving psoriasis. And in that sense, obesity is driving psoriasis. But there are other ways. Uh, the, thing, the thing is, to, to, to become obese, diet plays a role in that. We know that in Western countries, uh, US, partly in Europe, that the type of diet that people have, which is called a Western diet, contributes to obesity. So there are other factors, like the diets themselves. And that's work that we did in our laboratory uh, a few years ago. We showed that feeding mice a Western diet uh, uh, for only four weeks. And at four weeks, the mice don't become obese. They don't have a lot. They're not that heavy compared to their control-fed mice. 
but yet those mice fed this Western diet that has high levels of fat and sugar, very similar to an American diet, uh, actually had signs of psoriasis in the skin. And so we published that in the JID. And so that was able to show experimentally, um, and that's, this is the power of doing work in, in animal models. It's very difficult to do this in humans. You can't just take a thousand people and, and force them to eat a, a Western diet uh, like we did with the mice. Uh, so in mice, we can do that. And then we can show that the diets themselves, probably through changes in the microbiome in the gut of these mice, uh, can contribute to obesity. And, and it's a very, that part of it is very complicated. Bacteria produce other bacterial byproducts that can certainly influence the immune system. They can affect gut uh, integrity. And so um, many other effects come from actually changing the Western diet. So now we're starting to start to thinking about this differently. It, it's not so much the obesity itself, but it could be the diets that lead to obesity that contribute to to uh, uh, inflammation. So, so that's in, it's a very complicated topic. Great question, but um, that is the kind of thing. And, and these Mendelian randomization studies can help distinguish between uh, uh, environmental factors that uh, that cause disease versus those that are simply associated with disease because of the power of the technique. Yes, and I think this also bridges perfectly to the first abstract that was presented with a gut microbiota, right? Because, I mean, the diet will influence the gut microbiota, and this could mm -hmm. also yes. influence disease outbreak or disease severity. So I think these are questions that are very likely uh, being to, to be connected. And there was also a question from the audience from Basant El Nadi. Is there any ongoing studies to target microbiomes in case of IBD, PSA, and psoriasis? Um, is there any one feeling... Um, expert in the field, at least to the best of my knowledge, there's no such ongoing study. Yeah, uh, that's that's actually an area of great interest. Yes, there there are some. Uh, the, the first studies are actually done in uh, alopecia areata, and 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 most dermatologists are familiar with that condition, and they have done fecal microbiome transplants (FMT) uh, basically. So you and it's not difficult to do, uh, um, and they've actually found in at least some patients, it doesn't turn out to be something that can treat every patient, but some patients when uh, given fecal transplants plants from healthy individuals, so these are individuals who have uh, alopecia areata, of course, they, they are the recipients, the hosts are normal, healthy individuals. They take the uh, fecal material and transplant it into the, uh, the, the, the recipient who has alopecia areata, and they've found significant changes in, in the hair growth. And so it's, it's kind of fantastic. And it hasn't been completely worked out how, 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 what the mechanisms and byproducts of the bacteria that do this, but it's clear that in some ways, changing, altering, de deliberately changing the microbiome of a person with an immunological disease can, can help uh, their, their condition. And so um, I think this is, to my knowledge, they haven't done this in psoriasis, but they, the people are probably thinking about uh, the ways of doing this. Actually, in our mouse studies, uh, we, we have done microbiome transplants, and you you can actually influence the, the, the disease, and I encourage you to see some of our JID papers about that, uh, to see how uh, these fecal uh, microbiome transplants can influence uh, immunologic disease. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I, to the best of my knowledge, they also did a similar study in PSA without really good results. So I think this is something that might also relate then to psoriatic disease overall. But I think there's, as Dimitri said, there's so much information um, on gut microbiota uh, associations and also with skin microbiota. And I think we are just understanding a, a very tiny bit and we need to understand better to also have more targeted um, therapeutic uh, approaches, right? Um, Paolo, uh, do you still have a question? I saw that your hand was raised, uh, so uh, feel free yes, to I join in. I have, I had just very two short comments. That is, they they did a Mendelian randomization analysis, uh, finding that uh, obesity is a risk factor for psoriasis, and then uh, adiponectin could be normalized by using biologics. 
we had an experience, uh, a study several years ago showing that uh, the level of reconnectin were lower in patients with psoriasis compared to control, but they restored to normality when they treated uh, effectively with uh, TNF inhibitors uh, and re with the reduction of the PASI score. Thank you, Dr. Hisandi. Um, I do have one more question about the first abstract, which was about the definition that they arrived at with through the Delphi consensus. So it said, I took note of it, right? A sustained improvement in the disease course of plaque psoriasis resulting from a change in the pathophysiology that minimizes the need for treatment. And I wanted to get like your thoughts um, on what you, you think about this definition. You mentioned, Dimitri, you found it practical practical and pragmatic. But as I was listening to it, I was thinking at the same time, it's not that specific, right? So what are the changes in the pathophysiology we should be looking for? Because this could be defined from a molecular perspective, from a, a histological perspective. So do you know there was there any discussion around that? How can we better refine this definition to be able to apply it? That's awesome. It's actually, thank you for the question. I think it's, uh, for my sense, I think they're referring basically to the guide study. So it's like about the TRM, the, the T memory cells, and okay. how that could maybe change it and how maybe you could, I don't know, spare more the dosage. So not using it every eight weeks, but like every 16 weeks, or maybe ideally, changing the use of the biologics or even stopping the biologics. So I think they are referring to this, but in now more and more, I think we're gonna get, like we had this knockout study from Risa as well. So I think it's like, it's referring to this, I think. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I guess we will move on to the next section now. Thank you so much, Dr. Huang and Dr. Luz for putting all this together. And if we move on to the next slide, now we're going to be talking about clinical topics. Ahmed Atilan um, has put together this presentation supported by Dr. Paolo Hisandi. So welcome both of you and feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ahmed Atilan. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm... Uh, yeah, I am an assistant professor of dermatology in Turkey, and my senior, uh, Dr. Paula Gisandi, is an associate professor of dermatology at the University of Verona, Italy. And we've selected three uh, beautiful studies. Uh, at the first abstract, we will look at the malignancy rates in patients with and without history of malignancy. And uh, we also group them according to their biologics and non biologic exposure. In the second abstract, we will look at how we are accurate when we are detecting uh, microscopic skin uh, anatomy structures like neurovascular or some epidermal uh, structures when uh, in our clinical examination. And the last abstract, we will look how inflammatory how inflammat the intestine of psoriasis patients. Uh, and these are our disclosures in our next slides. Okay, and yeah, our first abstract. Uh, in this first abstract, as we all know, uh, patients, patients with psoriasis have a higher risk of uh, malignancy. And also if uh, psoriasis patients had a history of malignancy, they are not included in clinical trials. So our knowledge is uh, limited how uh, biologic treatments are safe uh, on these patients. So in this study researchers, uh, wanted to shed some light on uh, this question and they use solar data. Uh, and uh, who is Pusolar when we looked at? Pusolar is a uh, long-term international register system and uh, for psoriasis patients who use biologic and non biological treatments. Uh, so it's almost for uh, maybe almost 10 years uh, they are uh, registering patients. And when we look at the study design, next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, they have almost sorry one yeah, 13000 patients and their median follow up period was almost 8 years and they categorize patients based on their uh, magnesium history and uh, their uh, drug exposure biologic or non biologic uh, in the next slides uh, uh, in the next slides when we looked at uh, among these uh, 13,000 patients, almost 500 patients had a malignancy history. And 13% of them developed NIV or recurrent malignancy. Uh, and when we look at the charts, uh, if they used non-biologic agents, uh, their malignancy rates were higher. So, but on the contrary, uh, patients without any malignancy history uh, the malignancy rate was higher for biologic agent exposure. Uh, if we looked uh, at cumulative malignancy rates per 100 patient years, uh, patients with a positive malignancy history and who use uh, non-biologic agents, uh, their risk almost reach uh, 3.6. Uh, next slide, please. So how we interpret this data? So. Firstly, it indicates that there is no increased risk of uh, malignancy uh, with biologic exposure, according to this data. But there are some shortcomings. First, they didn't uh, give some detail about uh, which uh, non-biologic agents were used, sacosuprine or acetretin. Also, they didn't give detail about uh, which biologic agents were used. Uh, so next slide, please. When we look at the literature, uh, there is similar uh, study, and again, they used solar data. Uh, but in this study, they just recruited patients who do not have any uh, magnesium history. And they were categorized uh, for methotrexate, ustekinumab, and TNF-alpha inhibitors usage. And only if a patient uh, exposed any TNF-alpha inhibitor more than one year, uh, found to be associated with increased magnesium risk. But for methotrexate or ustekinumab, they didn't uh, find any association. So still for this uh, question, we need some more detailed and wider uh, data. And we can pass to other next study. In the study uh, comes from Netherlands and dermatologists and biomedical engineers studied together. And they wanted to see how we are accurate when uh, addressing uh, microscopic uh, skin anatomy. Uh, in our clinical examination, epidermal thickness, uh, scaling, vascular volume, and norm volume. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to answer this question, they recruited 23 patients, and they uh, made their detailed examination, and they collect their uh, information, clinical information, and they took uh, skin biopsies from these patients. Uh, next slide, please. And they analyzed these skin biopsies uh, by using advanced 3D microscopy. And they looked for epidermal thickness uh, and neurovascular uh, volumes. Uh, and then they compared these uh, results with uh, the clinical examination uh, data. Next slide, please. Uh, when we looked at uh, the, the, last, uh, the left, uh, we can see the schematic depiction uh, of uh, the psoriatic uh, skin epidermis, papillary dermis, and antiquary dermis. And uh, the neurovascular structures are important. When we look at the real pictures, we can see there's a huge variety among skin, uh, uh, psoriatic uh, skin lesions. Uh, and we can see this variation in epidermis, in deep dermis. And uh, also this variation is uh, true for uh, both vascular and nerve structures. Uh, next slide, please. And then they made uh, some says uh, analysis and how can uh, how accurate can uh, we ask, uh, can we guess about uh, epidermal thickness and vascular volume and they found correlation between uh, plaque induration and microscopic epidermal thickness also they found correlation between plaque erythema and uh, microscopic vascular volume however next slide please they didn't show uh, they didn't find any correlation between each perception and nerve fiber volume. So next slide, please. How can we interpret this data when we ask? Uh, we are failing uh, to uh, understand neurovascular anatomy of psoriatic skin lesions. So uh, this can be explained 
apply some mechanisms. Uh, first, central mechanisms are important, maybe in uh, in the each of uh, stereotic lesions. Also, in each, not just neural pathways, also immune and endocrine and vascular pathways also important. So when uh, we are uh, addressing each in stereotic lesions, we should consider central mechanisms as well, immune and endocrine uh, factors. Uh, thank you. And our last study, it comes from Turkey. Uh, as we all know, psoriatic is, uh, psoriasis is widely accepted as a psoriatic disease because it's a systemic disease. And researchers wanted to see uh, the inflammation uh, in the intestine of psoriatic uh, psoriasis patients. Uh, and for this aim, they use uh, fecal calprotectin. Calprotectin is a S100 protein family member and it is mainly located in neutrophils. If there is an inflammation in the gut, uh, neutrophils migrate uh, to the gut and we can detect uh, calprotectin in faces. Uh, actually, it is uh, mostly used in gastroenterology clinics because it's very important for the diagnosis and monitoring of inflammatory disease like Crohn and insertic colitis. Uh, and when we look at the study design, uh, they recruited eight adult stress patients, sorry, 80 and 80 uh, healthy volunteers. And when we look at the results, they found a uh, five uh, fold increase uh, in fecal protect protecting in stress patients compared to healthy volunteers. Next slide, please. And uh, when we take as a limit uh, 50 microgram per gram as a threshold uh, for upper limit, almost all stress patients uh, was above the limits. And when we uh, take threshold uh, for severe inflammation limits, 250 microgram per gram. Almost half uh, of psoriasis patients were above uh, these limits. Uh, again, next slide, please. Also, these uh, fecal calprotectin cal levels were correlated with, uh, with PASI and PSA. Uh, also, psoriasis patients found to be uh, have more gastrointestinal symptoms. And this in this scale, as we can see, they look for some symptoms related to stomach and intestine. Interestingly, this symptoms scale uh, was not correlated uh, with fecal calprotectin. Next slide, please. And uh, how can we interpret this data? Uh, first, we don't know if uh, this increased uh, level of uh, fecal calprotectin is uh, in, uh, does it indicate any inflammatory bowel disease risk or not? Uh, but uh, as my own speculation, if we connect this data with the old literature, as we know, uh, stress patients had more severe damaged intestinal barrier. Also, their gut microbiome is uh, disturbed uh, compared to uh, health people. So maybe uh, this simple test can uh, show uh, can help us to choose treatments, for example, between IL-17 and IL-23 inhibitors, uh, because IL-17 inhibitors, as we know, they are important for the integrity of intestine and also their important uh, defense mechanism, again, uh, candida. So uh, maybe it can help us uh, to choose correct treatment for our patients. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, sure. now we open it up for questions and I think there's one in the queue in the chat now. Or if, um, Paolo, you want to make any comment, that's yes, also, of... you're also yes, invited. Of yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to Ahmed for the having selected these very important uh, topics, uh, clinical topics, and also for the presentation. I think that uh, the topic of uh, treating psoriasis in the patient with a positive history of neoplasm is very important topic from clinical perspective. And uh, my experience is that uh, uh, several years ago, I was uh, very embarrassed. I was in difficulty, not very secure in the selection of a biologic. Today, I feel more confident in selecting those biologic uh, with uh, IL-17 or IL-22 inhibitors. I would prefer to avoid TNF inhibitors. 
there is no data that uh, uh, TNF inhibitors could increase the risk of recurrence as well. But uh, uh, my speculation is that uh, the less the immunosuppression is, the less is the proportion, the risk to have a disease relapse. So I think that today, if a patient that has a severe psoriasis, needs a treatment, history of neoplasm is possible to manage the ba this patient also with biologics. And the data provider from the solar registry confer this topic. Concerning the issues of uh, chronic inflammation in the gut, and uh, is it interesting topics? Several years ago, uh, we found that there is a entesopathy in a patient with psoriasis without arthritis uh, that could be uh, valuable, or could be visible using ultrasonography. This uh, has been replicated uh, by different authors, different uh, uh, ultrasonographists, and uh, it is likely that this entesopathy is uh, early sign of psoriatic arthritis, a risk of psoriatic arthritis. I'm not sure, we need data, that there is also a gut subclinical information, gut subclinical information uh, that is uh, possibly a biomarker of general inflammation of a biomarker of risk of ABD. However, in my practice, I do not see many patients with concomitant IBD and psoriasis. In contrast, I see many patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. But the association with uh, IBD and psoriasis, of, of course it is, of course it is, but it's not so frequent as uh, other. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, these are my comments and uh, thank you, Ahmed, for your brilliant presentation. Thank you. Uh, Guinea, I, um, but Margo, I think I see your hand raised. Yeah, so it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Just also one or two comments exactly uh, at the same topics as uh, Professor Gizondi commented on. Uh, so well done for selecting these abstracts because actually these are the things that we see in clinical practice. And in terms of, uh, you know, the biologics and cancer, um, we see now that during the last years, oncologists also are much more uh, happy to go ahead with a biologic agent. Uh, some years before, you know, there was a bit more of reluctancy. Now, um, everybody's more happy to do that. Rheumatologists are also very happy, uh, but also dermatologists are becoming more familiar with these clinical scenarios. What is really important with all these type of patients is to do a multidisciplinary um, discussion. So uh, include the oncologist, include the dermatologist, include the rheumatologist, and ask the patient, explain to them the risk benefit ratio, and it should be a joint decision. Other than that, I think that all the papers are in favor of giving biologic agents, even anti TNFs. Uh, so personally, I prefer to give an IL-17 inhibitor or an IL-23 inhibitor, uh, but still there are cases that you need to give an anti-TNF, and again, it's about risk-benefit. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's uh, comment number one. And in terms of the fecal calprotectin and the correlation between psoriasis and inflammatory, dis inflammatory bowel disease, I mean, yeah, it's not that common. It may be there. I think we need more data on that. But definitely, fecal calprotectin is a very, very useful tool, especially for patients that you are not really sure what is happening. So often we see patients, they say, look, um, uh, you know, I have some diarrhea. I have seen some blood in my stool. Um, I have been diagnosed with IBS. And we are not really sure what is happening. So fecal calprotectin is an amazing tool, easy, cheap, it can be done immediately. And depending on the result, then you decide if you need to refer the patient to another specialty or not. So I think we as dermatologists, we should be using that more uh, in our routine practice uh, when seeing patients with chronic inflammatory diseases. So yeah, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Let me shift the question to Fabian as a rheumatologist, like on these two topics, right? On risk of malignancy, you're 
your 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 comfort with with, with prescribing anti TNF versus the others? Do you take a different approach? No, I think this is very in line. I mean, just, just in general, the rheumatologists still prefer uh, anti TNF much more than the dermatologists mm -hmm. do, um, for reasons that I think we are just more comfortable using it. We have very long term experiences, and concerning the joints overall. Um, anti-TNF is at least as efficacious as I see it from other modes of actions and especially when also speaking about concomitant IBD that we see more often uh, I guess than uh, I just heard from you um, uh, monoclonal anti-TNF is what is okay for the skin is good for the joints is good for um, potential uh, uveitis is good for uh, IBD so I think this is the, you, you can't do anything really wrong when prescribing anti-TNF. This is what the um, rheumatological take on this is. Regarding uh, a fecal calc protectin, I think this is something um, very interesting to assess further. With a small limitation, I think it's not very specific. As said, it can also be a, a signal of just systemic inflammation. It does not, not necessarily be... Um, uh, gut inflammation that we see when the uh, fecal carprotectin is elevated. And we also had, there was a biopsy study in patients with ankylosing spondylitis, so actual spondylar arthritis, without any symptoms. And all, almost 50% of the patients without any GI symptoms still had subclinical uh, gastrointestinal inflammation when being colonoscopy and um, having histology. So I think this is something that is very interesting and especially when thinking into the future, um, doing prognosis, risk prognosis and as, um, personalized treatment decisions, I think um, such yeah, in non-invasive techniques can help us to guide us better. For me, at least, we are not there to really understand the, the, the value for us at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Chris, any other comment before we move on to the final session? No? All good? Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hizondi and uh, um, Dr. Atilan for putting this together. It was wonderful. And we will move on to the next and final session. Yes, thank you, Lourdes. I, and I think really great summary. And as said, for the clinical topics, the ones that are really um, bugging us in our clinical uh, routine. And now really excited to move on to for the treatment of psoriatic disease. And here Margot and Maria Gigini um, was already um, commenting on the clinical topics and she was supervised by Professor Megan No from the Brigham's Women Hospital. And yeah, Margot, we are looking forward to your presentation and thank you for preparing this together. Uh, so thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I would like to thank also Professor Megan Noe for her support. And uh, I selected, you know, my three highlights. So highlight number one is about bimekizumab and its potential impact on liver fibrosis in patients with moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. So here we have some long-term pool data from B. Bright study, which was the open label extension study. Why I selected that abstract and that topic, the reason is A, bimekizumab is the latest, latest biologic agent that has been approved for psoriasis, but also for psoriatic arthritis now. So it's always interesting to see some data on one of the newer available treatments that we have. I mean, it's not that new. It has been around for four years, but it's still, you know, the last uh, biologic agent that it was approved for uh, psoriatic disease. And also, the other thing is that liver fibrosis is a really hot topic. Personally, I'm really passionate about that. It's during the last two or three years that I have started screening my patients for liver fibrosis in clinic. And uh, I mean, it's important for me, but it's important for all of us. Why? Because patients, uh, there are common pathogenetic mechanisms between psoriasis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And what is very, very important is that patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, a percentage of them will develop NASH. And what happens is that a percentage of these patients with NASH, they will develop uh, liver fibrosis. 
Uh, so when we are reaching the stage of liver fibrosis, the changes on the liver, they are irreversible. So that's why it's really, really important to screen our patients and treat them accordingly. So uh, what this uh, study tried to do is that uh, there were already some uh, data from um, uh, the two years of Bimekizuma being available. And the data showed that uh, the clinical markers for uh, liver fibrosis and also key liver enzymes, they did not have any change over a period of two years of Bimekizuma treatment. So what the researcher tried to do was to assess the impact of bimekizuma on liver fibrosis and liver enzymes within a period of four years. So uh, the data were pulled from uh, many different studies, like the BVVID1, which was a comparison of bimekizumab versus ustekinumab, b sure versus adalimumab, b ready, and we have again the open label extensions of B-Bright. In terms of the protocol, I mean, the protocol was similar in all these studies. So the patients were randomized to bimekizumab 320 milligrams every four weeks to week 16. And then after that, they received bimekizumab every four weeks or every eight weeks. And after that, they entered the open label extension. So uh, in terms of liver fibrosis, um, the gold standard still remains uh, the liver biopsy. Is it practical? No. Is it cost effective? No. Are there any caveats? Uh, yes. Uh, why? Because we may not take the right part, so we're not able to assess the liver fibrosis. So that's why during the last years, we have more of non-invasive uh, tests in order to assess the liver fibrosis. Uh, so we have the FIB4, we have also the APRI, um, I'm not sure, you know, if you're using any of them personally, I use both of them to be uh, honest in my routine practice. And uh, based on that, and according also to the American Academy of Dermatology guidelines, uh, patients were stratified whether they have a um, low or a high risk of liver fibrosis. So what did the results show? Um, here we can see very, very well that for patients who had a high risk of advanced fibrosis, so we can see the upper line, we see that the line is dropping. So actually, we see that um, patients with high risk of uh, advanced fibrosis, uh, their fit for score dropped. On the other hand, for patients who had a low risk of advanced fibrosis, what we see, we see almost a horizontal line, almost a parallel line to the, um, um, uh, almost uh, a horizontal line, which shows stability, and it shows that we didn't have a lot of changes. So both of these data and both of these lines are quite reassuring for us. Why? Because the patients who have a high risk, their FIB score lowered, and patients who had a low risk, their risk remained the same. And apart from the FIB4, generally we tend to combine that with another score, which is the APRI score. And uh, here uh, we see that again, patients with um, advanced fibrosis, again, we had a slight drop in their APRI score, while in the patients with the absence of advanced fibrosis, again, we see this horizontal line, and again, we see this stability. So the APRI scores remained more or less the same. Um, somebody would ask, why do we use both of, both of these scores? There are different algorithms as suggested by hepatologists. So we combine these two and then we decide when we need to offer a fibro scan or not, or if we need to proceed even with a liver biopsy. So overall, what we have seen is that uh, apart from um, the uh, FIB score and the APRI score, we see also that the ALT levels the AST levels and the platelet counts uh, remained um, also, uh, you know, similar. So in conclusion, what we see is that um, um, the FIB4 score and the APRI score for patients with um, a high risk for liver fibrosis, we saw a small drop. And for patients who had a low risk for liver fibrosis, there was no further impact and probably, you know, uh, the reduction uh, in the risk, uh, actually, you know, the scores remained more or less the same. 
so again, in terms of ALT and AST, we saw a reduction in patients with a higher risk of liver fibrosis. And uh, the um, levels were consistent in those patients with low risk over a period of four years. And in terms of platelet counts, the levels remained consistent irrespective of the, liver, of the risk of fibrosis. Of course, I mean, this study, you know, it had a small number of patients, so the sample size is small. Nevertheless, it's quite reassuring and we definitely need more data towards that direction. So now moving forward to my highlight number two, um, um, and we are just talking about a new oral molecule for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. So we have J and J uh, 77242113, and we are just assessing its efficacy and safety in patients with moderate to severe psoriasis over a period of one year. So somebody would ask me why I selected that abstract. And the reason is that uh, there are still huge unmet needs in terms of oral treatments. So, I mean, we have a premilas, we have ducravacetinib for the last few years. There are some new TIC2 inhibitors that are under investigation at the moment, but there are still huge unmet needs in terms of oral uh, treatments. Uh, the second reason that I selected that abstract is that um, um, we are talking about an IL-23 inhibitor. Uh, so we, as dermatologists, we have been really, really happy about using IL-23 inhibitors. They have great efficacy in terms of skin, really good longevity, excellent safety profile, and it's something that we have been using a lot. I know that rheumatologists, they have not used that so much. Uh, I mean... Fabian and other colleagues uh, will comment on that later, but um, there are more data also about psoriatic arthritis and one of the IL-23s. So that was the second reason. And the third reason is that because in these studies, the Frontier 1 and the Frontier 2, they um, approach these studies and the results via a treat-to-target approach. So again, the rheumatologists here, they will come and say, what's new about the treat-to-target approach? And the answer is that in other specialties, but also in rheumatology, this has been happening for years. In dermatology, it's something that we are embracing more and more during the last years. So let's see now a few things about the objective of this study. Uh, so uh, what uh, happened is that we have the Frontier 1 study that uh, showed superior clinical efficacy of this molecule versus placebo at week 16. They did very, very well in the three to target uh, goals. And uh, then we had the long-term extension, which was Frontier 2. So what the researchers tried to do here was to assess the efficacy uh, of this molecule over a period of one year for patients with moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. So in terms of materials and methods, you can see uh, on the next uh, slide, here we are. So what we see here, we included patients with moderate to severe psoriasis with the classic targets, uh, more or less. And we see that uh, patients were allocated to different uh, treatment groups and to do different uh, doses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we see here in terms of baseline characteristics, we see that the majority of the patients between all the different groups, they have a passive of approximately 20. So uh, we are talking about a challenging category of patients. It's not like a PASI of 10. We're talking about a PASI of 20. So we are expecting to, we're having more expectation. So what we see on the right-hand side is that a greater proportion of patients on this molecule achieved PASI equal or less than one or PASI of zero. When we are looking at these passes, we're getting really, really excited. And the reason for that is that we are talking about almost clear skin or just completely, completely clear skin, not even a tiny patch. So here, what we see on the purple bar, because we are going to focus on the dose of 100 milligram twice daily, we see that at week 16, approximately 45% of the patients achieved a PASI equal or less than one 
And at week 52, this percentage improved, increased, and approximately 57% of these patients had seen that score. And again, in terms of PASI zero, again, the percentages seem quite exciting. Another point here is that patients who were on um, placebo before, they did also quite well. And here in this slide, what we see, we see that the PASI score dropped significantly. So there was a significant change and also very quickly, even from week four. And also at week 16, we see that approximately um, um, 80, uh, there was uh, approximately a percentage of 80%. And over the week uh, 52, we can see that this improvement was at a score of 90%, at a percentage of 90%. So we see very, very well how uh, patients have been responding. Um, uh, and uh, last but not least, I mean, they looked also at the BSA. I think in America, they use it more of the BSA. In Europe, we are using more of PASI. It's always an additional tool to see if there is an um, extensive disease or if it's more of localized disease. But again, we see significant improvement. So overall, we see the treatment with J&J 2113. It showed robust and sustained improvement in terms of skin. The uh, goals uh, from a tree to target approach, they were achieved. Uh, also, uh, what uh, we show, what we have seen is that um, we have uh, data from week 16, but we have also data through a period of a year, and that's also quite reassuring. So that's why we're really looking forward to more data about this new oral molecule, and um, let's see what will happen in practice in a few years. And now moving forward to my highlight number three, uh, Dimitri mentioned very briefly about the guide study. So we have the results from guide study in part three and uh, the long-term remission in patients with psoriasis treated with Uselcumab within 15 months from onset of symptoms. So what we are seeing here and why I selected this highlight was that the guide study is one of the first studies uh, to assess uh, the potential of early intervention. Uh, it's also one of the first studies to talk about super respondents. And it's one of the first studies uh, to assess the potential of disease modification. And that's again a really, really hot topic because we have been discussing for years about disease modification, about early intervention, but now we see data in front of us. So the objective of this study was to investigate the impact of disease duration on the median treatment-free period and long-term remission in patients who were super responders and they stopped treatment with uselcumab, which is an, another IL-23 uh, study. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, what we are seeing in terms of guide study, it's a relatively complicated study and it has many different parts. It has uh, three parts. Uh, so at the first part, patients were um, receiving Guselcumab at the standard dose. Uh, then uh, patients who were super responders, so patients who achieved a PASI of zero, completely clear skin at week 20 and week 28, they were uh, randomized to take Guselcumab either every eight weeks or every 16 weeks. Patients who did not do so well, uh, they, um, they were randomized again to another arm and Uselcumab was offered. And we are reaching our current part, which is part three. So super responders were uh, patients who still had a PASI of less than three at week 68. So in these patients, pa treatment was stopped. And we wanted to see what happened. So next slide, please. So what we are seeing here is that uh, patients were stratified based on their uh, disease duration. So we have with the dark blue, the uh, ultra short disease duration, which was less than 15 months. With the light blue, the intermediate uh, short disease duration. And with the gray one, uh, we have the long disease duration, which was more than two years. 
So here, what we see is that patients who were super responders and they had a shorter um, a disease uh, duration, they did much better in terms of their absolute passes compared to the other groups. Moving forward now, next slide, please. Again, here we can see in a very graphical way that patients with uh, ultra short uh, disease duration uh, remain treatment free. Uh, so they were not on guseltumab and they remained um, treatment free and their skin was still quite good for longer period compared to patients who had a longer disease duration. So we can see that the median time for this uh, very short uh, disease duration was 456 days. And moving forward, Again, here we can see that the super responders with a low, uh, with a shorter disease duration, did better compared to the other groups. And behind all that, there is a hypothesis that IL-23 may have the potential to prevent the development of cellular disease memory. Why is that important? Because we know that skin has memory. Uh, so uh, that's why we tend to see that in patients who have psoriasis, the psoriatic plaques tend to develop also in the same areas. So um, if uh, what happens with IL-23, it uh, leads to the differentiation of resident memory cells. They become uh, pro-inflammatory cells. And then uh, the IL-23 prolongs uh, the presence of these um, 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 tissue uh, memory cells. So if we block that pathway, theoretically, we are intervening to the memory of the skin and we can potentially modify the disease. So the conclusion is that the sooner that we treat patients, so if patients have a short disease uh, duration, they will do better. They have a higher chance of doing better and for longer period. And also early, very early treatment can potentially modify the course of the disease. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for this brilliant overview about the treatment highlights from EADV and Margot, brilliant presentation. And also thank you, uh, Megan, for the supervision of Margot and preparing those slides. Maybe I could start the question and answer and invite the whole faculty to join in and ask questions and also the audience to write your questions in the chat and the question and answer function. So um, how is it just me as a rheumatologist, I see patients more likely when they have long-term disease, both from uh, skin disease, but also joint disease. How is it? Is it easy for you guys to find patients with a symptom duration of less than two years in clinical practice? Margo, is it, how, can you elaborate on this? At least today, it may take up to 10 years on a systemic treatment. Nevertheless, in other countries that access to care can be quicker and easier, um, this can happen in reality. So because I'm Greek originally, and I have worked also in Greece, I have seen patients with a really sore disease duration coming in our clinic and asking for help. But as you say, you know, the majority of the patients, they will be seen much later. And that's why now in Manchester, a pilot um, clinic was run. So patients with inflammatory diseases like psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, they got a priority and they were sent very, very quickly. And I'm sure in the next, uh, you know, few months, some of the data will be presented and we will have more data about uh, this type of patients. Maybe okay. I can. Yeah, sure it is. Yeah. Oh, I saw Paolo also I unmute himself. So I let Paolo go first and then I go. Yeah, thank you. I agree with Fabian. Uh, the, the issues of uh, uh, starting early the treatment uh, is uh, related to the issue of receiving the patient early. And it's a, a matter of network between GP, between uh, other dermatologists and the hospital. And uh, uh, today, the mean wait of length of time we receive the patient is 10, 15 years. 
from the diagnosis. So what, thank you for that comment. What I was going to comment is, is also in how this links to psoriatic arthritis too, right? So there's the PAMPA trial ongoing, which is a trial in which they're looking at the efficacy of guzalcumab to prevent the onset of psoriatic arthritis. So trying to, to, to give this biologic to people early in their disease stage, trying to see if it modifies the effect. So how important it is to continue to 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 diagnose early no matter what the disease is right like ideally like psoriasis so that we can start treating them early and potentially prevent the onset of disease mm -hmm. um and then uh, very exciting to see the new molecule from j and j in which we're talking about an oral il23 um and i wanted to i was i was wondering like of course there's no head to head compared to an injectable biologic for an il23 yet right Anybody aware of any of those? No. Okay. I, I have a, a short, I have a sh very short comment consideration that is we have the target IL-23, IL-17 new molecules, but we have no other uh, targets in the field of uh, research of psoriasis. This is uh, understandable because uh, targeting IL-23 and IL-17 is very good, it's very effective. But uh, if we compare re clinical trials uh, ongoing on atopic dermatitis, they have a lot of new targets, you know? In the research of psoriasis, uh, the, uh, the target uh, uh, under investigation are still IL-23 and IL-17 no more. Yeah. Maybe I could also ask a question because I mean these were quite quite yeah fascinating results. Do you know already, uh, Margo, how these uh, study uh, design will uh, develop further? So which um, dosage they will proceed with, and how um, yeah advanced these uh, further um, investigations are already. Uh, so, uh, as far as I'm aware, I think they will go with a 100 milligram twice daily, but correct me if I'm wrong. And I know that they are progressing also in other areas. So there are also studies about inflammatory bowel disease and other inflammatory conditions. We are, uh, the, the data are quite reassuring. So they are progressing, you know, with phase three studies and all these, uh, processes. So we just really look forward. And does the compound already have a name, or is it still J and J and J? Like that, still like that. Okay. And maybe and if I may, can... maybe sorry, maybe we can invite also Chris because I think you highlighted Margot that there is an unmet need for oral therapies, and maybe Chris, just from the patient perspective, I think you have already had um, um, both um, um, uh, subcutaneous injections in your. Uh, medical history, but also definitely um, um, oral drugs. So what would you prefer? I mean, this is an easy question, I guess. I, I you know, I, I think so. And not just my experience, but I think in general, right, patients would prefer, and it's probably easier to get them to yes, to say yes, if it's an oral therapy. I was looking at the data, Margot, and was curious if there might be an option in um, for long term, so once you load the patient and use the 100 milligrams BID, could you potentially go to QD therapy? Because the QD therapy at the end of the treatment phase wasn't really that far off from the, you know, uh, granted these aren't phase three trials, right? So the, the responses might be greater than what we might see in a phase three, but would there be an open label arm where you could go to once daily? That would be even better for a patient, right? I, I think oral better once a day, better than twice a day, easier to remember to get your best treatment response. So that, that was one of the questions I was gonna pose as a, as a potential treatment opportunity that'd be very patient friendly. But also going back to this, sorry, I, I mean, obviously, um, oral therapy would be preferred, but can we just sum it up? 
it needs to be effective as well because then even if it's uh, subcutaneous and but as long as it is uh, more effective you would still prefer this route right yeah so that's a good point actually uh but you know just going back to your question so chris um you know johnson at the moment they are having a lot of discussions about that there is also again uh you know this discussion about dosage how often i think this is a discussion that we have for all type of uh treatment so i think at the end they will uh end up with something that is convenient for the patient as you say and also effective. So now uh, moving to Fabian's question. Uh, personally, I'm really excited with the day that I think the rest uh, of the panel here are quite excited because until now, with all treatments in terms of efficacy, things were a bit more limited. So now we see a new oral treatment that seems to be quite promising, quite good results. So if we can have an oral IL-23 in our armamentarium, it's definitely an advantage uh, you know, for all of us, for us as physicians, but also for the patients. Because every patient has you know, their specific concerns, their specific uh, expectations, needs. So you know, this will help us tailor the treatment more to their needs. You yes, know, very I, important I, point. Yeah, I had a, another question, and it was related to the bimikizumab data that you presented, Margot. Mm -hmm. And I, I was curious because I had not sort of, I, I wasn't aware that this, this analysis was ongoing, so it was sort of new to me to think about. Um, what were, because it, it did include open label data. And I guess my question is, did any of the dropouts in open label include anyone with higher liver function tests, right? So were there any abnormalities or dropouts as a result of that? I'm not that familiar with this study, so I don't know, but that would be something interesting to understand, right? As we look across a very long open label um, trial period. Just curious if you, if you know that. Uh, so, I mean, uh, if I understand well your question is that whether in this open label extension they included patients that they had transaminasemia, for example. Yes, or because usually in open label, not everyone, you do end up with some dropouts in open label and your treatment, you know, number goes down. Mm -hmm. Were any of those patients that, that were lost to follow up um, or who had who exited because of a high level, you know, how might that have impacted what the future sort of impact was? I, I was just curious. So I think, you know, in terms of assessing liver fibrosis, uh, this is something that is not done routinely uh, during the clinical trials. And nevertheless, you're able to calculate that. There are calculators online uh, based on the other tests that you're doing, and you're able to calculate that risk with FIB4, but also with APRI. When you have liver fibrosis, it's not definite that you will have transaminasemia. So your liver test may still be normal, despite having an element of fibrosis. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I found that study really, really interesting because it assessed that risk and it showed that potentially, is it the drug? Is it the better control of the disease that contributed to that? Because we know also that liver fibrosis is definitely related to the disease. It's definitely related to comorbidities like obesity, uh, diabetes. So it's really reassuring to see something like that. Definitely we need more data. We cannot you know, make an assumption just based on uh, with this small number of patients with this high risk for liver fibrosis. But it's it's exciting because it is an exciting field and we are paying more attention to that now. Maybe if I can bring a comment about that abstract too, is like while while you could see that there was no change in the in the low risk group and the other one we see like a small decline, we also see a lot of variability, right, during that time frame. And maybe it would be interesting to see what's happening in those time points, like what are the correlations with those variabilities to understand better what's driving this change. Um, because you don't see like, like a smooth decline. You actually see lots of ups and downs, ups and downs. So something, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but maybe it's just a comment. 
No, it's an excellent um, movement, actually. Maybe well, I can also ask a stupid rheumatological question. When you were presenting in abstract two, um, the data on the oral IL-23 inhibitor, I was kind of missing the PASI 100 response uh, rates because here it was different. It was then a PASI of below one or below zero. So this is another way of looking at it. Is this typical? typical is this a change in the uh, outcomes? Because it might be a bit harder to compare to, to other trials, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's a very good question, but you know, there have been papers. So uh, there have been some papers from uh, Satvir Mahil from St. John's that was published in 2020, 2021, something like that. And they show that probably these are uh, I mean, PASI 100 means PASI zero, completely clear skin. And in terms of almost clear skin or PASI 90, this correlates with the, with a PASI of more than zero and almost equal to three. Uh, so there have been studies trying to do the correlation to the classic PASI 90 and PASI 100. Uh, so it's not easy to do the comparison exactly as you say so directly. On the other hand, because there have been co correlations about absolute passes and the PASI 100, PASI 90, uh, I find that really helpful. And for me, it's also an interesting approach because we are talking about this tree to target approach. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarifying and elaborating for me. Well, we do also have uh, uh, two questions in the in the chat and or comments. One is from Cheryl Rosen, and she says that a problem with early treatment with a biologic is the requirement to fail conventional therapies, at least there in Ontario, Canada. But I think this is also uh, quite quite common in the practices where we treat our patients all over the globe, right? So I think this is a very important point that we need to take into account. But maybe based on results like from the guide study, this might be changed in the nearer future. So I think this is something that we could really hope for um, uh, for the sake of our patients. And also um, a comment from Arti Kevina, one of our grapple presidents at the moment, congratulating all of you for your brilliant presentations and for the choice of abstracts. And he was also checking if these um, presentations will be available on demand. And this is something that we can assure you that you will find them on the Grappa website um, where you can really uh, look anything that you have missed or want to go into detail and go back to this. And if some of you uh, were not able to join today, you can still watch it on demand. So I really enjoyed all of the abstracts that were presented. And I think the, the especially the selections were so important from the clinical perspective and also making basic science very understandable for me as a non-translational um, uh, scientist. And also the treatment highlights uh, selected by you, Margo, were just fascinating and giving us a very yeah, positive outlook into the nearer future. Um, without uh, saying a lot of yeah, heartful thanks to Annie Spengler from Grappa Administration, who was doing so much work of putting this together. I can only hand over to you, Lourdes. As always, it was a real pleasure co-hosting this um, session with you. And yeah, thanks to all of you for your hard work and dedication. Likewise. Thank you all very much uh, for working so hard to put this together, for spending an hour and a half with us discussing all these abstracts. And it was a pleasure to, to hear from all of you and we learned a lot. So we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, AC, uh, virtual highlights, which will be for uh, ACR, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. ACR, because... Thank you. <laughs> and Annie, thank you so much for all your, your support behind the scenes and putting all these advertisements uh, together, which really look great. So this will happen on Wednesday, December 4th. Uh, and with that, goodbye. Thank you so much. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. 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 Ciao.